the Research and Development Cell of Kannur University, in association with the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, organized a public lecture program on various topics from the 12th to 23rd July 2022. The second lecture was on the topic, How Will We Understand Our Constitution?, which is led by Dr. G. Mohan Gopal, former Vice Chancellor, National Law School of India, Bangalore, and former Director, National Judicial Academy, India, Bhopal. I would like to begin by wishing everyone a very good morning and uh, paying my respects to uh, Dr. Sabu A, Pro Vice Chancellor and Director IQAC, to um, uh, Professor Anil Ramachandran, Director, Research and Development Cell, uh, uh, Professor Sheena Shukur, um, Professor of Law, um, uh, Sri Pramod Kumar um, uh, K, uh, uh, KV and uh, Dr. Chandra Mohan, uh, members of the syndicate uh, who are uh, honoring us uh, with their presence. Um, I would like to also uh, extend my uh, greetings to all the f faculty members and students uh, assembled here today and thank uh, all of you, the um, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and uh, Professor Sheena Shukur and Professor Anil Ramachandran and other faculty members uh, for giving me this opportunity <coughs> to uh, spend some time thinking along with you about our constitution. And I'd like to thank all the students who have assembled here uh, to join this process of thinking together and I would invite you uh, to these few minutes of, let's call it a meditation on the Constitution. <laughs> uh, normally when we talk about the Constitution, especially because I am uh, in the field of law, and to those who are in the field of law, the Constitution is what mathematics is to, is to an engineer. It is, uh, it is the f foundation from which we draw all our understanding of our own discipline. So it's very fundamental, so it's very important for us. But people normally tell me, what's, uh, what is this constitution, sir? Look, you know, this is absolutely no consequence. Look at, you know, we sometimes trivialize it and say, look, look at people throwing garbage on the roads. What is this constitution? <laughs> it is absolutely no consequence. And then we can go further up and say, look at how many crimes are being committed, look at how, how much of corruption there is, uh, how much of, uh, of strife there is in the society, uh, how our rights are being violated by the, by the, gov the government officials, by maf private mafia, how women are uh, tormented um, on a daily basis, how the sh scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and other marginalized sections of the, pe of the people are exploited. And then we've had this constitution for uh, 72 years and the republic for 75 years. And this is a dead letter. So, why, so you must also be sort of dead if you're <laughs> saying that this is the main f source of your own thinking and your own work. And then I must, uh, although I don't know him at all, uh, also begin by expressing my gratitude to Mr. Saji Cherry and former minister for making certain comments that have suddenly made this topic much more important. But uh, well after it was decided, I suggested it and it was accepted by the university. And perhaps both I and some people in the university may have thought it's a very boring topic. But some comments, this gentleman who I've never met and I don't know at all, uh, some comments that he, ha he has made has suddenly triggered a very strong reaction uh, about this constitution and what he said, such that he has had to resign his ministerial position and there's a strong demand that he should resign from his membership of the Legislative Assembly because he has taken an oath 
He has sworn to have faith in the constitution. Not just to obey it, but to have faith in the constitution. And if you have sworn to have faith in a, in a document that you have this view on, then um, it sort of raises uh, some questions. But I personally feel that he has done us all a service, intended or unintended, by um, raising these questions so that we can actually have a, con an, a, a con conversation that we, of the significance of which has become much more obvious, that we need to understand this constitution. And as I said, Mr. Cherian's freedom to not understand the constitution and express views that he holds with or without an understanding of the constitution is guaranteed by the constitution. He is protected by the constitution. So uh, we, this question has become relevant and uh, when people, uh, he was not alone in decrying the constitution. He may have done it openly, he may have done it honestly in a transparent way, but many people say this about the constitution. Um, and uh, he was holding a particular position which made his statement much more uh, significant and perhaps much more inappropriate than if he had expressed it as a private person, which is very common in the country. So we get, we get this, uh, uh, this uh, reaction um, that it is a useless document. Some others say, yes, it is a document which has some very good things, but people have no awareness about it. There is no awareness, they don't understand what it is, although the preamble has been put on notebooks and textbooks and you know from primary school people there has been a lot of communication about the constitution we find that uh, even people who are occupying very high positions uh, don't seem to have a, a deeper understanding of this document and um, so th there is need for constitutional literacy, constitutional education, and I agree with that. However, I, there is a, a dilemma in, in accepting that, because the strongest group that defends this constitution in the most sincere manner and understand the constitution so deeply, not only the constitution, but also the constitution assembly debates, is the other Dalits of this country, the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, one quarter of the country. They're deeply committed to the constitution. They understand it deeply. And not one of them has ever told me, in my limited experience, that this is a useless document, this is a dead letter, we need more literacy. They see their, they say this, they see this document as a beacon of hope. As the only source of strength in an otherwise dismal landscape. So it's strange to say that the most marginalized, the least educated, are the most aware of this document. I've learned a lot from them about this constitution. Frankly, I've learned very little from my own community of law teachers. I've learned from them about this constitution. And that's what I'm going to share with you actually today. But the most educated people in the country are completely clueless about the constitution, disinterested about the constitution. That tells us something about this constitution. Who it is for and who it is against. And for that we need to understand the constitution differently. Now if you ask lawyers, and yesterday I had the pleasure of interacting for some time with uh, some of the LLM students who are here, who are very, very, uh, very impressive in their knowledge, in their discourse, in their questioning, wonderful schol young scholars. I asked them, uh, what is the constitution? And as 
very uh, highly educated lawyers would reply, they said it's a supreme law. They use uh, the Sanskrit, uh, sorry, the Latin word, um, uh, suprema lex, the supreme law. Lex is law, suprema lex, supreme law. The constitution is a supreme law. And they're right, it is a supreme law. But when we understand the constitution as supreme law, we, um, there are two words to it. One is supreme and the other is lex. When we say supreme, we are looking at it hierarchically. But we are saying it's law. It's just that it has a rank higher than other laws, which are statutes or subordinate legislation. So it's just a hierarchical explanation of what is just law. With uh, very different, um, uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a different procedure for altering it. A higher standard of uh, majority to alter the law. But it is ideologically neutral, that understanding of law of uh, a constitution, that it's a supreme law. And there are many con countries in the world which are dictatorships, military dictatorships, monarchies, that have constitutions. And most military dictator dictators, they take over power and then they announce a new constitution. In some countries, constitutions are changed so often that they'll ask you which edition of the constitution. If you go to a bookshop and say, give me a copy of the constitution, do you want the 2020 or 19 or 18, which edition do you want? So just saying it's a piece of law somehow doesn't communicate to us. And then it becomes actually a technical issue for lawyers to understand and judges to understand and, in and interpret. So it's not that. It's much more than that, especially for us. And then when we look at the second word, lex, we say, what is law? What is law? Again, we get a conventional definition that law is, as John Austin said, the command of the sovereign. That's also neutral because whoever is sovereign gives, a, you, know, gives you a command, then that is law. And that definition was more relevant and opposite when the sovereign was the king, was the king, was a monarch. Or was an oligarchy. Oligarchy is uh, uh, a, a country governed by a few people. Oligos means few people. As a chemistry professor reminded me, oligos sac saccharide means a few s molecules together rather than a disaccharide or a monosaccharide. So oligarchy is uh, ruled by a few people. And monarchy is by one person. So the command of these people have the same state, you know, are, we are, so if a country becomes a dictatorship, you are told that law applies to you, regardless of whether we are a dictatorship, we are a democracy. And that does, that is not consistent with the definition of democracy. Democracy comes from two words, demos and kratos. Demos means common people. Kratos means power. So democracy is not just voting every five years. It means that Kratos' power is held by demos, common people. Power is held by them. Not even delegated through a social contract to an oligarchy. But held by them, exercised by them. So how can we say law is a command of the sovereign when the demos is a sovereign and in a democracy the, uh, the command of the demos, the people, is, uh, is, is, uh, must be law. And if the people are holding sovereignty, the very uh, concept of law undergoes a big change. So we can then say that actually we must understand uh, democracy, sorry, the concept of law in a different way in a democracy than we do in authoritarian uh, polities. We can't cannot, from a legal point of view, understand it the same way. Where the power is located is different. So, Suprema has a problem, Lex has a problem. So, we can't just understand it, especially in our Indian context, as a simply a supreme law. So, then what is the constitution? 
Now, to understand our constitution and then build a theory from it, rather than take definitions from outside and say what is a constitution, let's look at our constitution and its history and let's build a theory on what is a constitution based on our own experience and then see if we can apply it to other, con other countries and other constitutions. So if we do that within the very short period available, of time available, I've already taken 15 minutes, maybe another half an hour. Um, if we do that, then we, are, we know that our constitution was drafted by the Constituent Assembly, which worked from end of 1946 to end of 1949 for just short of three years, mainly in 47, 48, 49. We know two things. We know that this Constituent Assembly emerged from a very prolonged, long struggle of the people, multi-dimensional struggles of the people. One of which was a struggle led by the Indian National Congress and Mahatma Gandhi, but there were many other struggles that were going on in the country, where there was an upsurge of assertion by the powerless against the powerful at many levels. And it is this upsurge that pushed the British out and made it impossible for them to, to rule India. And from when the British left, they, they had tried to bring in some compromise through the 1935 Act, some devolution and all that, it's a responsible government for the Indians and so on. None of that worked and they got pushed out. So we know that, we know, for one fact we know is that this constituent assembly and this constitution and this republic emerged from multiple movements of the powerless and the marginalized in this, in this landscape. We also know a second thing, which is that this constituent assembly was very, very much dominated by old, feudal, patriarchal people who were landlords, upcoming industrialists, the rich people, the powerful people of the country. And there was in this country, in this con constituent assembly, only a very small band of people that had a different conceptualization of what India should be. And they basically were two groups. One was a left group, whether they were social, social democrats, some, com you know, the one or two communists. And then there was this very, very important group, which was the group led by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, a group of Dalits. And if you read the Constituent Assembly, you will see that it is there, along with the support of some of the liberal, progressive left group, but it was their leadership that was decisive in this Constitution. So we know that as a result in the Constituent Assembly, there, are, there were five, uh, five strong socio-political visions at work represented in the Constituent Assembly. And these are number one, there was a vision that India after the British should be a Hindu Republic based on Varnashrama Dharma and the Vedic religion. And the many people who believed that strongly. There was a second group that believed that India after the British should be a Marxist, communist republic, nation. There was another group of people who believed that India should be a social democracy liberal welfare state, borrowing on the experience of the UK, Northern Europe, um, uh, taking some of the liberal reforms that emerged from the impacts of, uh, of various thinkers, including Marx, on how to have a more fair society. And lastly, number five, there was a group of people who believed that India should be a capitalist free market economy and an authoritarian uh, polity 
where the elite will decide what is best for the country and produce development and growth based on their decisions that people will have to obey. So there were these five visions of, of uh, what India should be. And the Dalit vision, which was articulated by Dr. Ambedkar, was different in the following respect. The Hindutva movement, if you read Goldwalker and others, rejected equality, freedom, democracy, and believed in harmony, but harmony based on Varna Vyavastha, not harmony based on freedom and equality. The Marxists believed in equality, but did not believe in individual freedom, at least till we reach a communist society. For them, equality was much more important than freedom. For the social democrats, for them also, they wanted equality more than freedom. The free market capitalists wanted individual freedom, no question of equality. Only the Dalits wanted everything. They wanted untrammeled liberty. They wanted unblemished equality. And based on this, they wanted unquestioned dignity and unqualified fraternity. They wanted it all. They were not willing to compromise on freedom to get equality. They were not prepared to compromise on equality to get freedom. They were not willing to compromise on dignity and they did not want a fraternity that was not based on freedom, equality and dignity. Very powerful vision. They believed in non-violence. Dr. Ambedkar spoke. He was against the death penalty because he said for the people basically were saying for these for the Dalits non-violence is very important they wanted to live in harmony with each other in peace and non-violence and with nature for none of the other four was non-violence really a, a supreme part a, a, a supreme norm not even for those who are following Mahatma Gandhi when it come, came to governance, they believed that violence had a legitimate role to play in taking, in governing a country. And so we have these visions and we had this unique Dalit vision. Now this Dalit vision is what is captured in the preamble. The preamble commits this country, we the people, we the demos of this country, we the common people of this country. We have constituted India into a sovereign socialist democratic republic, secular democratic republic, to secure to ourselves justice, liberty, equality, and dignity. And on that basis, the unity of the nation. The word constitute is the same word as constitution. The same root word. It's a remarkable statement. They're saying that India is not 5,000 years old. This India that we are, we are constituting is a new India. We are constituting it. In 1950, in 1949, when they adopted the resolution, 1950, it came into effect. We are constituting, means creating. Atoms constitute a molecule. <laughs> so similarly, what are the atoms that constitute India? It is these four ideas are the atoms that constitute India. The commitment to liberty, equality, dignity and fraternity and that together is what we call justice because justice is 
a set of eternal norms. It comes from the word use, J-U-S, which means the right value. Use means the right value, the right norm. Stis means stand. Justice means those values that stand forever. So these four values standing forever, eternal values, those values constitute India. And this constitution, and at the heart of these four values, at the heart of these four values, is the idea of compassion. Is the idea of Anukampa. As Narayana Guru said, Uru Pida Erumbinum Varitarid and Nulla Anukampa. Nalgu Gulil, Karanakara, Nintirume, Vitagala, the Chintayum. Uru Pida Erumbinum Varitarid and Nulla Anukampa. And then compassion. Other Buddha compassion. Other Vrata Sadha had a general compassion. Living at peace with each other and at peace with nature for centuries, untold centuries. They want to restore that. Up a compassionate Nenum, Varina Uru Varina Nile values on E. Samatvam, Sahodariam, Swadandriam, Swabhimanam. Compassion not in the sense of I am superior and I have compassion for you. It is feel Anukampa means feeling the pain of others. Kampana means tremble. Anukampa means when I see somebody's pain, I tremble. I feel that pain. Not that I have pity on them and I'm giving them Anukampa. I feel the pain. Those of us who are certainly those of us who are parents know that when our child is physically or emotionally hurt, we can feel that pain. We are physically affected. That is Anukampa. But Jnanapuram Parayam, this constitution, I have to get this book. This constitution is basically a book of compassion. To build a, a society where every person has a claim to equality, dignity, fraternity, and liberty. And the purpose of this constitution is to identify at the highest level the norms that constitute a group. In this case, it's, it's India, but it can be a small club, it can be an association, it can be any group that human beings form. At the end, there is a common agreement on what, are, what is the aspiration that brings us together? What is the aspiration that brings us together? The constitution is a codification of the aspiration that brings the people together. And that aspiration is to build a society based on equality, dignity, liberty, and freedom. And that is, that is the core of the constitution. So if Mr. Sajicharyan criticizes the constitution, my suggestion to him would be to consider which of these four values he is against. Because that is the constitution. Now, now we move forward. So we understand first that the constitution states the highest level values that constitute a group. Our, this group in this case is a republic, a nation. And that is these four values which are in the preamble. Now we say, okay, where do we go next? Now that is a very big achievement. The advantage of many European countries is that because they are all, they have a similar philosophical history or China, there is much greater consensus on what the core values are. The core values are that we must pursue. But here we don't have that luxury. We are a much bigger population and we have much greater diversity. So for this constituent assembly, diverse, regressive, uh, uh, largely regressive, small group of progressive people, uh, uh, me members, regressive members, an assembly with a large group of regressive thinking members, how did they agree on these four values? It's a great, great you know, miracle that they came together. And I believe 
that subconsciously what brought them together was the fact that in 47, 48, 49 especially, when they were meeting in Delhi, the f fire of the partition was raging around them. They could feel the heat in their chamber. Trains full of dead bodies were coming in and going out of Delhi on a daily basis when they were meeting in the Constituent Assembly. They saw a sight that no previous generation in India has ever seen. That is Indians slaughtering each other mercilessly in their thousands, tens of thousands. And they all agreed that this should never happen again. So the first objective in making this constitution, there is other parts of it, I'll come to that. The first objective or the first goal of making this constitution was very simple. We have to identify those core set of values by which everyone must live so that we will never kill each other again. Because if we don't live, if we kill each other, what's the use of anything else? What's the use of science and technology and all this if we cannot live? So they sat together and Ambedkar convinced them with his incredible scholarship and erudition and eloquence that these are the four values. If you accept these four values and proclaim them as the values by which all Indians live, then this republic will survive and these people will live in peace. So if I say I'm an Indian, what it means to me, thanks to this constitution is, I am a human being who believes in equality, in freedom, in dignity, and in fraternity based on equality, freedom, and dignity. That's what it means to be an Indian. For all human beings, not just people who are of one religion or one race or one place, we believe in, that's what makes us unique. And there is no other country in the world, thanks to the Dalit group, that believes in all four of these values and gives them equal importance and says that they're all uncompromising. There is no other example of any country in the world that has emerged which proclaims all four values as the values of the polity. That's the heart of this. But that created a problem. And that problem was, as I said, many of the other forces, all of the other four forces rejected these, the totality of these four values. Some rejected them in their entirety, some rejected some of these values. So there were two ways forward. One is exclude those completely and have a constitution which is purely based on these values and have a peaceful, non-exploitative society. The second was to accommodate, give some space, having asserted the normative supremacy of these values, give some space to these other, to these other forces as a compromise. If you did not do that, the other forces would have destroyed the constitution in six weeks. So Dr. Ambedkar, who was a master of, he really was the chairman, he was made the chairman of the drafting committee by other members of the drafting committee who were selected because they were towering intellectuals in India. They elected him the chairman, not the assembly, not the political uh, class, not uh, any political leader. It was his peers in that drafting committee who elected him a chair because they saw in him a capacity, a sagacity, a vision to create common ground. So he created that common ground. But that common ground meant that in this constitution, there are provisions, and to that extent, uh, I'm sorry to keep referring to him, I didn't mean to, but the, the comments of Mr. Saji Cheren are not wrong. There are elements in this constitution which will enable these other four forces to move forward. And they have used that space, whether it's Hindutva, whether it's uh, free market capitalism, with the exception of uh, the Marxists have not moved forward, but the, the free market capitalists have moved forward, the Hindutva people have moved forward. Um, and uh, th there are many provisions of the constitution which have come, which are a contribution of the left to the constitution. They have that space, but have they expanded that space in the constitution? They've not, they've tried to do that, but they've not had much success. But the, Hind the Hindu Rashtra argument 
and the capitalist argument have definitely used that space to expand their role and scope and power in this country, sometimes allying with each other. So there, there are these elements. And therefore, my last point, and then I'll, we should have some interaction after about 10 minutes, is that therefore I now s say for me, a co the Indian constitution is actually a site of struggle. It's a site of struggle. It's not a holy book. It's a site of struggle. Where there are elements which we consider positive and revolutionary, I consider positive and revolutionary, the elements which other people consider positive and, and revolutionary, I look at the provisions on fundamental rights, on equality and freedom and say, they, that gives me an opportunity to, to move these ideas forward. Others may look at the at 19.2 and say, look, here are, here are the bases on which you can restrict these freedoms. And they want to expand those freedoms. I may look at uh, the, the provisions on workers' rights or women's rights or children's rights and say these are very positive provisions. Others may look at the uniform civil code or cow slaughter as giving them space to move their agenda forward. I may look at secularism and uh, as, uh, as a, a very powerful idea in the constitution that I should move forward. Others may look at the, the recognition of the right to religion and the rights of religious institutions as space that they must use to move forward their agenda. So the constitution is a site of struggle. It began the struggle. It provided a framework for that struggle. It gave us all tools. We, those who believe in this vision of equality, e freedom, dignity, and fraternity, we've got a little bit of an advantage. We've got our view in the preamble. We've got a number of elements in the body of the Constitution. We have a bit of an advantage, but the others are also inside the Constitution. Therefore, the Constitution has survived. Therefore, Dr. Ambedkar said on November 25, 1949, now we have a constitution, fight inside the constitution, not on the streets. Because they didn't want people to be slaughtering each other on the streets. So the answer for someone who is from a Marxist ideology is not to attack the constitution, but to use the space in the constitution to expand his vision. The constitution provides that space. And like through judicial interpretation, through amendments, the space and understanding, and there's no time to get into it, but we, we should have, if you go into detail into how the, con, the uh, con, uh, judiciary has interpreted the f uh, right to religion, for example, you can see that the judiciary has interpreted the right to religion to hugely expand the power of religious, organized religious establishment. We saw an example of a Mohan Kumar Manglam who was a communist who brought in Justice V.R. Krishnayar who was a fellow traveler and, they, and he created space through judicial interpretations that are still very powerful in this country. So the challenge for us is to understand that this is a site of struggle. There are some tools available to fight is up to us, not the constitution. It's like the tennis court. If you get on the tennis court or the football field, the football field is not going to fight and make you win. You've got to play your game and win. You have to understand the game. If you're playing cricket, you must understand that you'll win by putting the ball out of the ground. If you're playing football, you'll understand that you'll win by keeping the ball inside the ground. Understand the game, play the game. But when there is a football field, somebody's created a, 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 a space for you. That's not by accident that the word court, C-O-U-R-T, applies to a legal court and to a tennis court <laughs> or a badminton court. A court simply means a defined space. So the constitution is a live instrument, a space, a structured space, where the same battles that have been going on for centuries, 
between these five visions, and there are others also, I'm picking the main five visions, should continue. And we cannot sit back and say, the constitution is like a waiter in a, in a restaurant, I want uh, chicken fried rice and I'm waiting and say, what is this constitution, it has not delivered my chicken fried rice. I have to go and cook it myself. It gives me the, 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 the gas oven, it gives me the, the cooking utensils, but I have to cook it myself. So my main message to you today is a very simple one. Please understand the Constitution as doing only two things. Only two things. One is, it identifies the basic values that bring us together, the basic aspiration that brings us together as Indians. That constitute India. That's why it's called the Constitution. It is constituted by these four values. Now it is up to us depending on our vision, whatever it may be, to interpret, explain, advance these four values to construct the society of our dreams. The constitution has, in addition to these four values, because it, uh, much of it has come from the 1935 Act, it has uh, in it um, policies, and I would say that the bulk of, uh, of the Constitution uh, are institutions and structures of governance. I would say uh, 12 of the 22 parts deal with institutions and structures of governance. I would say that uh, um, uh, policies are dealt with by only three parts. N norms, values, as I said, including the n these values, but expanding on these four values, are in five parts of the Constitution. The fundamental rights, directive principles of state policy. Although it is controversial, the fundamental duties, um, provision, a part that deals with, uh, uh, with provisions for certain classes, backward classes, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and the Scheduled Tribe Areas Act. These five provisions are normative, where they're trying to give power to marginalized and powerless, power to the powerless. But the bulk of the Constitution includes policies, institutions, and governance uh, structures, which are neutral, which are neutral to all this, which, ca which are not quite neutral, but, uh, you know, but can be shaped by all of them to their own ends and modified. That's why many in other countries, here I've not come across much writing, but uh, in fact, uh, uh, Professor Buchanan got a Nobel Prize for this, I think in 19, late 80s or early 90s, uh, or for, for studying the, uh, the relationship between, con it's called uh, uh, the constitutional, uh, constitutional economics. So the idea is to look at the, their perspective, their right-wing group, they, they are, their basic in interest is to say constitutions are, stru are st organizational structures that structure set out a, or a structure in which human activity takes place. And the way to measure that structure, they would argue, should be in terms of economic efficiency and not in terms of its capacity to advance norms. Right. And uh, so they are uh, there are economists, uh, there are political scientists who are trying to shape the, the very idea of a constitution in a non-normative direction, globally. But I think if we can develop from our country and our experience an idea of a constitution as a site of struggle, neither a set of norms, nor merely an economic framework, nor merely a political framework, but a site of struggle between social, economic and political forces, then I think we will be able to inform and instruct better global discussions on constitution and understand that this is a live uh, uh, site of struggle and we must struggle to be, and for having that struggle, we must have our own vision, our own vision of what that society should be. And all those visions, the constitution does not take sides on those visions. The constitution simply sets a platform for the struggle to continue on the basis of equality, dignity, liberty, and fraternity. Those are no inviolable, and that already weakens 
two of the of the five, uh, uh, two of the five, or even three of the five I, uh, of the five visions are weakened by just that normative choice that these four norms should should uh, control. But if we if we, uh, if we understand the constitution this way, then the last part I want to say it's 11:30, it's 45 minutes. The last point I want to say is that each of us sitting here, see, uh, we must take responsibility to develop our own vision, our own drishti, our own sankalpa, to take the Buddhist Ashtanga Marga, um, about what kind of society we want to have and what kind of society uh, we should live in. And we should maintain our freedom to develop that vision, do so with fraternity and respecting dignity, but on the basis of our equal right to have that that, uh, that, that vision of our own. Um, uh, uh, professor Tushnet of Harvard Law School, constitutional law professor, he basically made a very uh, re re interesting statement which is relevant to what he says. He says, fundamental rights are not protected by the constitution, they're protected by politics. His main work is to make us understand that the constitution is a place where political struggles are taking place. It is not apolitical. It is not non-political. It is simply the space where political struggles take place and it's the role of the constitution expands when forums for political, democratic political, uh, political struggles shrink or are weak. So when there is a robust space for democratic politics, then these struggles will, sh will and should take place in those spaces, not in the courts of law and in the constitution. But when those places shrink, those struggles and those conflicts are pushed into the judicial space, which where there are unelected people, selected in a very selective manner who will decide these political issues. And one way to subvert democracy is to weaken the constitutional sp political spaces so that political decisions will not be taken democratically but will be pushed into the courts and the courts will take these decisions. And so we have a bloated role for our courts, which they're not able to cope with. Why? Because our s they are dealing with political issues and our, s our space for political discourse and dialogue has been shrunk. Democratic discourse has been severely shrunk, probably does not really significantly exist anymore outside Kerala in any meaningful way. So we must resolve to fight our political battles in the political space using constitutional instruments where necessary. But we should not shift all our political struggles into the constitutional space and hand it over to judges to decide political issues because that will, they, that you know how they will decide that. So our responsibility is to recognize that there are major political battles that have only begun in 1950 between these five visions that we are only in the process of constituting India. So I, I always say, please read constitution as present continuous tense, the constitution of India, the story of the constitution of India, the story of how India was, is being constituted. Not as a book, but a document that gives us some ideas, a structure to decide about how this unique republic the first republic on the, in this landscape, democratic republic, is actually being constituted. The constitution of India. It's a story, it's like a movie, a documentary. The constitution of India. But it's ongoing and it has just begun. And it is political. And political fights must be fought in political democratic space, not in courts. So yes, this constitution gives us four political values, not values for the judges and the courts but to guide our political discourse. And those values must be expanded 
in a, in a progressive manner by us, in a regressive manner by others who want to do so, but that battle must take place in democratic politics. And we must recognize that, uh, al that law is centrally about politics. We must have these battles in the political space and develop the constitution from the political battlefield, not from the courts. And um, so if we understand that, we, are, we, we, are, we, we understand that if you ignore the bulk of the constitution, which is technical on policies, institutions, governance structures, focus on its preamble, fundamental rights, these five parts which tell us what the norms are that bring this country together, and strengthen the democratic foundations of, of, of those norms and build and expand them, then I think we would make progress on constituting India. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> I think I've taken six minutes over the 45 minutes. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, now this session is open for discussion. Over to your students. So let us begin our participation in political discourse right here so that we will start contributing towards the building up of a, to a, you know, that is our way that in which we will contribute to the constitution of India, by engaging in mindful, meaningful political discourse in political space, and where necessary, taking that space to the courts, where necessary, but the political decisions must be made in democratic political space. So let's begin our work on constituting India right now. <laughs>